I'd like to start by acknowledging that this webinar is hosted on the lands of the Wurundji people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years and acknowledge and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, we're going to hear from our speaker, Julia Watson. And that afterwards, after her presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions. So as a designer, activist, academic and author, Julia Watson is a leading expert on indigenous technologies, as seen in her monograph, Low Tech, designed by Radical Indigenism, published by Tashin. She teaches at Harvard and Columbia, while also leading an experiential landscape and urban design practice called Julia Watson Studio. After graduating from Harvard with the highest award for her work on conservation and spiritual landscapes, Julia has been widely published and co-authored The Spiritual Guide to Bali's UNESCO World Heritage with Dr. J. Stephen Lassing. Julia approaches design as a rewilding with a portfolio of projects, including the Reef Resilience Initiative with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. She received a Christensen's Fund for her work in conserving Bali's first UNESCO World Heritage Site and was a Disruptive by Design Ambassador for Wired. Low Tech, her book, and her movement has been featured in The Guardian, The Washington Post, and Fast Company. Born in Australia, Julia regularly, regularly travels to connect with sacred sites and indigenous cultures across the globe. So join me in welcome, welcoming Julia Watson. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie, and welcome everybody. I want to acknowledge I'm here in New York, and I am on Lenape land. And I'm super excited to be able to speak to my fellow Australians today. And I want to present my work on design by radical indigenism. So when, when COVID first began, and I want to acknowledge where we're here on this webinar because of, because of the state of the current global pandemic, a lot of people started to ask a question of me, which was, what does low tech have to do with COVID? which is a really valid question. And there are a lot of complex ecological explanations that we can talk about, about how COVID and ecosystem resilience are related to one another. The first being habitat encroachment, which leads to that zoonotic transfer, which allows a disease to jump between species. Biodiversity loss can lead to different, different species uh, becoming um, more prevalent in an ecosystem and therefore there's more contact between humans than there could be that passing happening there. And then poor ecosystem resilience has been coupled to climate change, which leads to poverty and migration and risky behaviors. And then that in turn leads to increased transmission of specific um, pandemics and, and diseases. And that's been mostly studied that particular type of pandemic outbreak in HIV cases in Africa. Next slide. But when COVID hit in the US, um, we were all suddenly wearing masks. And I'd recently returned from Australia where people some, in some cases were also wearing masks, but it wasn't because of this viral transmission. So there's this very simple way that I realized about how we could translate this idea of low tech to the current pandemic. And it became apparent by just looking around. And across the world, people from different cultures were faced with shortages of this protective equipment that we'd never really had to wear before. And it was really interesting to see all the novel responses that people had to making their own masks. Next slide. And people began fashioning face masks from anything they had lying around. It could be an old scarf, it could be an old sleep mask, a plastic bottle, and in some cases we even saw cabbage leaves. And so in that same way that people made their very own versions of a face mask when faced with a crisis, Indigenous people have been building local technologies in response to climate change from everything they can find in their ecosystems for millennia. And what I find so fascinating about these local technologies is actually how complex they are, how attuned they are to nature, and then what we perhaps could learn by looking at them. 
Next slide. And so Low Tech started as a book in 2012 while I was working on a project with the Balinese government to design a tourism management and a conservation plan for 40,000 hectares of sacred rice terraces, which became Bali's first UNESCO World Heritage Site. Next slide. And the terraces form this system that actually terraforms most of the island of Bali, and it's called the Subak system. And it's actually a cooperative of farmers, which is called the Subak, but the sacred rice terraces are also called Subak and the people are called Subak. And this was the technology that was featured in the book. And it was really sort of this first moment when I sort of launched into these ideas of what are these technologies? Next slide. And so while I say the book actually began eight years ago, the research began much, much earlier with a seminar course that I took at uh, University of Queensland, which was called Aboriginal Environments. And it was taught by Paul Mehmet, and I was a second year student in architecture school and it was a course that literally changed the course of my life. And then after undergraduate, I went on to study graduate uh, landscape architecture and worked for a few years. And then I had this idea that I would move to London like every other Australian in their 20s at the time did. But I actually went via Borneo. Next slide. And I'd become interested with an indigenous community that were living in Borneo called the Penan people. And they were nomadic forest dwelling people. And they were being systematically displaced from their lands by the government. And I was following the work of Wade Davis who actually then went on 20 years later to write the foreword of Low Tech. And I was also following the work of an environmentalist known as Bruno Mansa. And he was a Swiss guy who was living with the Penan and really helping them uh, to, to stand up against the government and to try and um, conserve their lands and stay on their traditional lands. So after a month in Borneo, on my way to London, <clears throat> I finally found this group of Penan people. They'd been moved from their traditional lands and they'd been settled into a government encampment and they were living beside a river. These are some of the images from... Uh, 20 years ago to that, that I took when I was visiting this particular community. And you can see that, I mean, the, the community was going from a very nomadic situation to a completely sedentary situation. And, and, I, and it wasn't working out for that community at all. Next slide. And so this trip really solidified my interest in, in how other cultures live with nature. And since then, I have traveled the world because I've had this suspicion that maybe some of our most sustainable innovations are actually rooted in indigenous cultures that figured out these ideas millennia ago. Next slide. And so the title of the book is Low Tech, which is a word I completely made up. So if you're mystified by it, that's fine. Um, it hasn't been published before. It's actually a combination of two words, uh, a word that you're probably really familiar with, which is low tech, L-O-W-T-E-C-H, and another term, T-E-K, which you may or may not be familiar with. But it's also a bit of a tongue in cheek poke at, you know, our inherited and it's often unintentional biases about these local cultures and technologies. And the technologies in low tech have often been described even to myself, as primitive and having taught landscape eco-technology and realizing that the technologies that we have available to us as designers uh, pale in comparison to these technologies. It makes me cringe when they're actually discussed in those terms of primitive because it's incredibly untrue. And, and these, these technologies are incredibly sophisticated and they embody all of today's sustainability principles like low embodied energy and low impact and low cost, and they're often formulated within a closed loop system. Next slide. And so for the second part of the title, TEK, that is the foundational knowledge of the book. And TEK stands for Traditional Ecological Knowledge. And it's defined as a cumulative body of multi-generational knowledge, practices, and beliefs. Next slide. And so, in the introduction to the book, there is a moment where 
there's a visualization of what TEK means because it, it, it can seem rather elusive and it's often talked about as these sort of four nested levels of understandings and this image on the right actually starts to explain what those nested understandings are and if you work through it it's it, we can sort of see it sort of in a somewhat of a pyramid if we want to translate it into the context that we might diagram and understand and at the top is the individual sitting underneath the individual is an understanding of your local conditions or your, your local knowledge and then within that you have an understanding of your resources management how how you manage the resources within your environment and then beneath that is your social institutions where you have access so for you that might be the university of melbourne and underneath that is a concept we don't really often talk about which is a worldview or a belief system and from a lot of the work it's really interesting that there are so many different ways that people conceive of different ways that human beings relate to nature and, and that is encompassed within these worldviews. And next slide. And so Design by Radical Indigenism is the way I've brought my interests of nature-based cultures into a contemporary context that I inhabit. And I'm not the only one trying to do this. I didn't make the term radical Indigenism up. That is a term that has been defined by a Princeton professor and a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, uh, Eva Marie Garut. And she has argued for a rebuilding of knowledge, contemporary knowledge, through explorations of Indigenous philosophies that are capable of generating new sources of knowledge and understanding and dialogues for the world today. And so I brought this thinking into the sphere of design and sustainability by arguing for a new look at indigenous knowledge and technologies to inform our contemporary understanding of sustainability and resilience thinking. Next slide. So low tech, uh, it's a book and I also see it as a movement. And it's a movement to rebuild that understanding of indigenous philosophy and vernacular local architecture and, and technology to generate sustainable, climate resilient infrastructures. Next slide. So in 2012, going back once again, when I began writing low tech, I was also teaching a seminar course at Columbia University on landscape ecotechnology and all the materials for this course were high tech solutions. And there is, here's a one example actually of one of the student projects that came out of that course. And this is a bridge that is located over a Superfund site. And a Superfund site is a site that's on a national register for its levels of pollution. Uh, so this particular project is a bridge that is infused with all these different types of technologies. There's piezoelectric lighting, there's carbon nanotube sponges that absorb oil and retain buoyancy. And at the very base of this bridge, there are oysters which filter water, actually five liters of water per hour to try and as a means of cleaning up this super fun site and also providing an infrastructure and a crossing. But still, it was all about these high tech solutions. And so in 1966, an architect, Cedric Price, he asked a really important question for our profession. And his question was, if technology is the answer, what was the question? And this provoked this thinking in the field of design to question the impact of technology on architecture, on cities, on societies. And 60 years later, I think we're still asking that same question, but I think we're also still asking that about sustainability because if we keep on going up higher and we keep on going out wider and we keep on going deeper into the earth to extract, to what end will sustainability actually save us if we don't systemically change the conditions by which we develop. Next slide. So as we are seemingly drowning in this age of information while starving for wisdom, we find ourselves at a crossroad. And next slide, we can either continue a very narrow view of technology informed by our distance from nature, or we can acknowledge that there is this is just one way and not the only way for humans to live. And to the other question, the other question is what would we understand by looking 
at the many hundreds or thousands of communities who've been scaling highly sustainable environmental systems for millennia. Next slide. So now I'm going to explain a couple of low tech technologies as multi scalar approaches that explore material, module, and system scales thinking, because that's the way we work as art architects. So living amongst, uh, back to the other side, living amongst the highest mountains in the Philippines and calling themselves the Sky People are an indigenous community called the Ifugao. And they are masters of terracing and they use water and they use rocks and they use soil as their construction tools. And these terraces form incredibly unique micro watersheds that serve as rain water filter systems. Next slide. And this is an incredibly steep, uh, mountainous and incredibly beautiful landscape. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And, and the Ifugao have transformed what would otherwise be a completely unusable hillside in terms of agriculture into incredibly productive land. And they're known as the unrivaled rice terrace builders of the world. And they cultivate these rice terraces at slopes of up to 70 degrees. So we're talking incredibly steep uh, territories. And so they create these combinations of shallow water, high nutrient level and really high productivity in these ideal growing conditions for organisms that are at the base of the food chain, as well as creating these agricultural terraces that feed their communities. And so many species actually rely on these terraces for food and for water and for shelter, especially during migration and times of breeding, making them actually also incredibly important biodiversity for, for incredibly important landscapes for global biodiversity. And so when we think of this in the system scale, these, system, these ecosystems are now considered some of the world's most important ecosystems because they act also as these massive absorption and pure absorption of carbon dioxide and purification systems for water running through them, as well as nutrient and biodiversity storehouses. So if we start to think about these types of incredible, we call them ecosystem services, so the services that they offer in terms of their um, uh, what the ecosystems can give to the world um, with a scale and a steepness that is synonymous with a skyscraper their biological performance really does have a potential for us to start thinking about how do we integrate all these types of services into our vertical landscapes could we could we think of doing that and it hints at how our urban and vertical environments could actually also become havens, not only for dense human communities, but also for aquatic, terrestrial and airborne biodiversity, as well as urban agriculture. So moving on to the next example that I want to show. Um, this is a, an islanding and housing system that's made from a single species of reed. These are called the El Tala Islands. And you can see that there's a arched house that's constructed on top. That is called a mudhif house. And these are island and housing technologies that are made by the Madan people who live in the southern wetlands of Iraq. And on the left hand side, you can see um, there are a series of vignettes that show one, two, three, four, the construction system by which they actually make these islands. First, they fence. The living reeds and then they build up layers of reed and then mud and then reed and then mud until this platform begins to float and then the houses are constructed on top and they've found these houses depicted in Sumerian Uruk imagery which says that they estimate these houses have been built in the same way for six and a half thousand years. Next slide. And the Kassab really, it's integral not just to the building of the houses and the construction of the islands, it's actually integral to every single aspect of the Madan life. It provides food for water buffalo, it provides uh, flour, ground down to flour for humans, it, and then it provides the building material for these completely biodegradable floating islands and their incredible cathedral-like houses that they construct in as little as three days. <clears throat> 
And the cassar breed is so versatile when it's dried. It can be bundled into columns. It can be woven into the walls and the floors, and it can even be twisted into rope that can bind these buildings without nails, which are not used to construct these buildings. Next slide. And these Madan villagers are uh, constructed in the marsh, as I said, as they have been for generations. It's estimated this community has lived and built in this environment similarly for six and a half thousand years. And these individual islands actually stay afloat for 25 years. So the final example that I'm going to show you is um, looking at a different a river system uh, which is polluted with sewage. And in a lot of places in the world, rivers are contaminated with sewage. But there is this Indian city that is home to 15 million people that actually uses its floodplains to treat half of the wastewater that comes out of the city every single day. And it does this through a combination of sunshine and sewage and a symbiosis between algae and bacteria. And the wastewater is broken down. This wastewater comes into this system, 95% water and about 5% waste. And it comes down the Hooghly River from the city of Calcutta. And then it's siphoned off by farmers into this large scale constructed wetland system. And it's uh, introduced into a series of ponds. Initially, they're settling ponds, and then they continue into 300 fish ponds. And this whole process of cleaning actually takes 30 days. Next slide. So on the edges of the city of Calcutta, which the edges of the city of Calcutta, that's flanked by the smoking escarpment of the city's trash. It's ribbon by highways. There's buildings being constructed all around this technology. This indigenous system has these 300 series of fish points and it cleans the city's water. But not only that, it actually produces the city's food as well. So the innovation is not just a model for chemical and coal plow free purification. It also provides approximately 100,000 jobs for the city. And since Calcutta's core has no other formal treatment system, it is the only way to treat the sewerage water that it's coming out of the city of Calcutta before it enters the Bay of Bengal. And the system is incredibly unique. As I said, it, it provides clean water or it cleans the water from the city, but it also provides the food. And the way that it does that is through irrigation water that's drawn from this system to irrigate fields that surround the system of rice and vegetables. And about 20% of the fish that's sold in the city of Calcutta actually come from this system. So it's an incredible closed loop system. Next slide. And so this thinking, as I've said before, it's not something new. It's designers have been talking about this for a very long time. And as designers, we are always working within conversation with people who have spoken about similar issues before us. And, and we'll be working with other designers in allied fields as well. And one of the designers that I've been working with and having a conversation with is Bernard Rudofsky. And he was a really famous um, curator at the MoMA. Right. And he designed this incredibly seminal exhibition in 1967, which was called Architecture Without Architects. Next slide. And not only that, I'm also having conversations with uh, people from different communities. And one of those conversations have been with Indigenous elders like Jim Anote from the Zuni community. And he's also the de director of the Ashiawan Museum and Heritage Center on Zuni territory. Next slide. And also conversations with other people like Jasim al Asadi. And he's a Marsh Arab. He lives in that landscape of islands. He was born there, of the islands and the cathedral like arched houses. And he then went on to become an engineer and a scientist. And he now is the leader of one of the organizations that is really protecting the culture and restoring and regenerating the marshlands um, of this, uh, the southern wetlands of Iraq and, and the Madan community. And in the book, there are a series of interviews and just Sim Al-Asadi was interviewed in the book. And, and it was really important that um, these interviews were actually published in Indigenous language first and second in English. Next slide. And that, that was so that 
no matter who picked this up, up, the, up the book, if the person from a particular community that could not read English, they would have a means to read and hear a voice from the particular community that they come from or identify with, that they could, they could have a relationship with the book and hear directly from a person from that community. And so this is sort of a segue, previous, go back one slide, sorry. As I'd mentioned before, um, I'd worked with uh, the Subak farmers to design the uh, World Heritage, Bali's first World Heritage site. And that was also a conversation. We produced a book which we published in both languages, in Bahasa and English, and we gave that to the Subak farmers. We began that conversation with them about what did they envision of their World Heritage. Next slide. We, we did a series of publications actually for this particular project. And this particular project was really important actually because it actually started my own design studio. And I was invited onto this project uh, to design this new model for world heritage um, for Bali's UNESCO World Conservation Area. And as I said, throughout the project, I collaborated, um, or as was mentioned by Anne-Marie, with a complexity scientist who now leads the Complexity Institute at Nana Yang University in Singapore. And together we came up with this uh, master plan. It was called Pintu Jabang Tanasuki, which means gateway to sacred lands in Bahasa. We also wrote chapters together. We designed this guidebook to Bali's uh, spiritual sites. So this process of conversations about the landscape and about the process and what the meaning of world heritage was, was really important to that project. And so next slide, this new model for conservation really understood this site as a living sacred landscape that involved protecting not just places and landscape, but also mythologies and practices and, and the rice terrace farming and, and all the different um, ceremonies that the Subak farmers actually use as ways to remember to remember how they're um, relating to the landscape and, and how they're growing the rice in these sacred rice terraces. And this is a particular map showing Lake Batur. And you might be familiar with um, Mount Batur, but at the bottom of Mount Batur on Bali is Lake Batur. And it's said in the mythology of Bali that the rice goddess, she lives at the bottom of the lake. And in the monsoon, she allows the water from the lake to, to, um, to overflow and go down the sides of the mountain and then to feed all the rice terraces. And what's interesting is the reason these rice terraces don't need any fertilizer is because of the incredibly nutrient and mineral rich soils that come from this lake and this a volcano that then allow this regeneration cycle every time the monsoons come through to regenerate these same rice terraces that have been used for over a thousand years. Next slide. And so designing uh, this World Heritage Site, we were designing gateways from abandoned buildings and we were linking walking tours from different sites that had never been thought to be linked before. We were choreographing these types of experience that would give this opening to this different type of living landscape and living conservation. Next slide. And this entire landscape is made up of these rice terraces. And while looking at these rice terraces, I began thinking about how they could perform also to mitigate the impact of tourism, which was, you know, why UNESCO World Heritage Sites are sites that are protected, but they also become incredible tourism sites. And tourism has its own set of problems. In this case, I was proposing that we could adapt areas within the rice terraces that, that, so that they could become vertical wetland cleansing systems and that the rice terraces would then start to clean some of the water that was coming from uh, the tourism infrastructure and polluting the water of Bali through this rice terrace system. So starting to reimagine how the tourism in infrastructure could combine to actually have these co-beneficial effects to the environment. So that's where my studio started uh, six years ago. And this is where the studio is at now at a di very different scale. Uh, we just completed our project uh, in New York. And so coming back to New York where I've now lived for the last 14 years, 
I've been exploring this concept of rewilding of landscapes. And rewilding is actually a term that's often used by conservationists to talk about um, how to restore an ecosystem. What I think is interesting is when designers take hold of these ideas like conservation, which I have been quite critical of in terms of their passivity, and really start to activate them and, and think about you know, what does rewilding mean in the terms of a, a landscape architect and an architect? And it can mean these ideas of untaming of urbanism towards these ideas of radical localism. And people are really starting to identify with these ideas of localism now given we're living in a panda era of pandemic given we are limited in terms of like the scope of our daily footprint where we go and thinking about how our local environments can really offer us much more than they do currently and so the other idea is that we could use biodiversity as a building block for designing incredibly biodiverse and diverse local symbioses and so on this site, which is really interesting and something that not a lot of people know, is that Rockefeller Center was actually the first botanical garden in the entire US. It was called the Elgin Botanic Garden, and it had 2000 native and rare exotic species that were cultivated there. And so this was a design for a socially distanced summer garden for the Rockefeller Center. And it was inspired by the wild American meadow and it's planted with native grasses and perennials and trees that are indigenous specifically to the Northeast region of the United States. And what's so interesting is they don't usually use many natives, if any native species in these types of urban environments in the city of New York. And what's also interesting is when you see this type of planting and landscape next to the landscape that still exists and the old type of plantings when the wind blows these grasses and and these perennials they move and they they rustle and they make sound and the yew hedges and the petunias and the buxus hedges are stiff and they actually don't move and i keep on equating it to this idea of growing old gracefully and botox and one allowing movement and the other staying very, very still. And, it, and it's incredibly different, this dichotomy that you see in these different types of ecosystems. But this is the indigenous ecosystem of, of this particular place. And so the ambition was to bring this language of botany and of biodiversity back to the city and, and to also educate people who this, this location usually gets hundreds and thousands of visitors every year and if people can see these indigenous types of landscapes and plantings and and the and the combinations and understand that this is what this landscape is actually made up of originally and that these native plants are are better to use they're drought tolerant they're pest resistant they're a far better alternative to these ornamental species that it becomes this educational experience as well next slide and so I see the work that I'm exploring in low tech as very critical at this time, especially because species extinction alone will not be the 21st century's greatest loss. I truly believe that the exact same forces that drive species extinction also endanger these indigenous technologies that are nature based that may hold the key to our survival. And that so low tech suggests, next slide, low tech suggests that there are nature based solutions to climate change and that we don't need to be passive and we don't need to just think of the ways that we can combat and mitigate climate change are through conservation areas like forests. We can think of the ways that we can mitigate climate change really actively and by living symbiotically humans and natural systems and many many species like the Kasi hill tribe here this is an image of a bridge that is grown from two trees on the side of a river it's called the living root bridge next slide and and these these new technologies they can be active they can be adaptive they can be these incredibly complex coexistences of human and non-human species, and they can use this biodiversity as these building blocks for a different type of alternative future. Just like these living bridges, they're created actually, this is an image of how they're initially created by guiding 
they, they create these scaffoldings made of bamboo over these bridges, and then they guide and grow these root trees until, from either side of the, the river until they've grown to the other side of the bank where they then plant them into the bank. And eventually this structure grows around the bamboo as the bamboo eventually rots and, and goes away. This is a 1500 year old tradition of growing these living root bridges. There is a youth organization that's a Kasi youth organization called the Living Bridge Foundation. And they're working to teach and to restore and they go around and maintain all these bridges. And at the moment there are 75 of these structures that take 50 years to grow, but in this landscape they last for centuries. And next slide. So whether it's carbon emissions or whether it's viral transmissions, ecosystem resilience is fundamental to mitigating climate change and global pandemic. And climate change, it has shown us that our survival is not going to be dependent upon superiority. As we've previously conceived, it's going to be dependent on symbiosis and shifting our thinking from this sort of idea of superiority and survival of this fittest to this idea that is not mine either. It's actually uh, uh, an ecologist. Um, the survival of the most symbiotic is an incredibly critical first step. And so just want you to take a moment to imagine what we could learn from the thousands of nature-based cultures on how to design nature-based technologies and settlements so that the mistakes we've made in the past and in the present won't be repeated in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Um, it's a bit like quiet usually, but there would be a round of applause for your wonderful presentation. It's really a, an amazing body of research. Uh, and thank you very much for presenting that to us. Um, now, if you have some questions, and I'm, I think there already are some questions here, Julia is willing to take um, to answer some of them. Here's one that asks, in designing with the Subak people in Bali, how much of their mythologies did you have to learn and understand? So the great thing about that project was Steve Lansing, who I worked with, he'd lived and worked with the Balinese for 40 years. And this is actually a really great question to actually understand how do you how do you formulate these relationships? Because the relationships to, to begin to understand knowledge and, to, and knowledge sharing are incredibly important. And fortuitously in that situation, Steve invited me to work on the project, but he already had, he actually wrote uh, the UNESCO submission that got that landscape uh, protected. So he was working with the government. He was working with teams of scientists. He was not indigenous himself but he was very familiar. He'd written numerous books on um, in the cosmological understandings of the island of Bali, which is incredibly complex. And I had to learn a lot, but I had this incredible guide. Um, and, and that was really important to that particular lens, the relationship. And so I think kind of the biggest learning lesson out of that is you know, there's, there's a certain patience and a certain um, timing, I guess, involved in, in, and these projects don't come up very often but there's this um there's also this really important trusting relationship that has to occur and there are often it's often a it's a difficult scenario to try and find that particular person in a community or multiple people in a community that will that that you can engage with and that's actually part of the design process as well as fostering these connections and fostering these conversations great um Here's another uh, question. There's some accolades, which I'll share them with you. You deserve them. It says, thanks for a great talk. Incredibly amazing work in recentering indigenous traditional ecological knowledge systems and amplifying First Nations voice at a global scale. Also incredibly beautiful graphics, photography, and communication of these ideas. Great example of collaboration. Well done to all involved. In sharing these uh, examples of radical indigenism, I'm interested as to the absence of reference of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the book. Uh, your response? Yeah, that 
I mean, that was because I didn't have those relationships and within the time scale of the writing and the formulation, we had started to write chapter uh, on a technology from Australia, but we didn't have the time to really foster that relationship and, and then get the permissions to publish the imagery. And that's really important. And so um, that was even, even though I'm an Australian person, I, I don't spend much time there anymore. And, and, be, and I didn't have that particular uh, steward to formulate that relationship. So that was actually the reason in, with, with respect to having to formulate that relationship with the particular, with a particular community, um, that, that was the reason why there was not, uh, uh, any references from home. Okay. Um, here's a question. Um, this is in reference to the rice field terrace in the Philippines. And this question says that actually, uh, th this is a type of technology that changed the morphology of the mountain itself. Mm -hmm. Are there, you know, it's a thousand years old and we almost forget, but it is still man-made, right? So is there any bad effects because it definitely altered the natural state of how the original ecology of the mountain was, but maybe it's so old that nobody in this time, we don't know about these changes to the natural uh, ecology and what was made to the natural state, or they say, can we just by looking at it, the wildlife lost in the habitat? So are we just saying, okay, this is better than what we have now, although that is also replacing a natural ecology. I mean, I think it's a valid point to say, well, we don't have records of what was there a thousand, 1500 years ago. But I also think that, you know, this landscape has been occupied, occupied for a really long time. So I'm not quite sure how far we're going to go back to say, what's the original ecology? Um, and, and when do we separate this particular community from that original ecology and ecosystem. What I would say is most of these technologies, they're really built on, on, on really understanding that balance and, and using that, that idea of biodiversity as a building block for these systems. So I think we can safely say if, if, a lot of these systems are now recognized as incredibly important for global biodiversity, as incredibly important in the global food web, as these, as these sinks of carbon. The way we start to sort of measure um, what, is, what is biodiverse and what is a, a really healthy ecosystem, our measurements of that landscape tell us there's this incredibly biodiverse, it's incredibly functional, there's a really wide diversity of different species from lots of different kingdoms living in this landscape, occupying a landscape that people are developing and people are farming. And that's what's different is we, we don't go in that direction anymore. We offer monocultural farming landscapes. We don't exist with uh, our conditions. And, and I think that part of the, this question kind of gets really to, to a fundamental understanding in the book that you know we can't really separate humans all the time away from nature we've been we've most of us have come out of this idea that you know there's humans and we're distanced from nature we live in cities and and nature isn't so much in cities and that's not the way the world works and 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 nature and 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 humans these are these are systems that are called socio-ecological systems and they are ecological systems that are there because humans exist there and they maintain and they manage and they allow these ecosystems to thrive. So you're, you're definitely not going to get pools of water in a landscape that's a mountain, absolutely. But you also wouldn't get the whole diversity of aquatic life in that landscape if those pools hadn't been brought about. And so you wouldn't also get a lot of the bird species migrating. Uh, and so there is an evolution in the the biodiversity and all the different types of niche, which are like all these different types of animals in an ecosystem. But when we measure it against a different type of degraded landscape that might be a monocultural palm oil plantation, there is, you can see these drops of biodiversity for certain types of development and a huge increase in biodiversity with these different indigenous types of landscapes and technologies. Okay, um, well, we have like 
28 questions and comments lined up. A lot of them are accolades. Um, just to a couple of repeated comments. Um, a lot of the content that you presented, if not most of it, is available. It's part of your book. That's correct. Yes. And um, so I said, where is the book available? It is out. Um, you, I bought mine at Readings, so maybe support Readings. You can order it at the Metropo Metropolitan um, Books, I believe, if they don't have it in stock. Of course, Amazon, but try to go <laughs> local first. That's your thought. <laughs> Do you have any new books? Like, what are you working on now? Like, or what's, what's coming up now? Are you working on your next book? We have started working on a next book. Yes. Um, there's a couple of publications, which I've done recently. We had a publication in Topos, The Water Issue. Um, and that is actually looking at some newer technologies. And there's also a publication in, it's called Landscape Architecture Frontier. It's Kong uh, Yu's. Uh, publication from Beijing um, and so there's two different sources for new material um, we're working there's a lot of projects actually where there's a lot of projects on the ground happening now we're doing a rewilding project in the UK um, we're doing this ongoing project with uh, and work with Rockefeller Center that I'm doing some consulting actually interesting projects doing consulting with big brands who are really trying to think about sustainability and systems thinking and how to embed this type of thinking into a more uh, corporate structure, which I think is, um, you know, it, it, it's, an, it's a really different way to start thinking how that would translate to a completely different field. Um, there is also a, a television series that we're working on. Um, so there is a lot uh, that's coming out of this. And if I can back you up about the book, uh, it came out in Australia in December last year. Um, you can find it, I think, in most bookstores and definitely at museums. Um, and a TED Talk, my, my TED Talk came out two days ago. So you can also see um, different concepts and some similar concepts and some different examples if you go to the TED Talk. Mm -hmm. I'll send around that link. Uh, this is a kind of a question I had uh, that Gordon asked. Um, how would one translate such low-tech solutions to another locality since mm -hmm. they're indigenous, you know, made up of th that culture, these kind of even vernacular? Um, yeah. What happens when you, you know, anyway, the question is, such low tech solutions to another locality where there's a similar environment yet totally different cultural background. Is yeah. that something that is fine that you advocate or um, is there, are there problems to that? So that's happened. So the, there's a system called the Kanat, which is in the book and it began in um, Iran and it's an underground aqueduct system and it taps an aquifer and it travels um, can travel many kilometers underground. It takes water in arid environments and it stops evapotranspiration so you retain your water source. And it actually was the reason that the city of Tehran exists because of this water source that came from the hills. And that system began and then migrated across the Middle East. It migrated into Europe. It migrated into Africa. Into It's through India and Southeast Asia. It can be found in the Canary Islands. And it has different names everywhere you go. But it all goes back to this specific type of um, technology that migrated across the globe. And so it's already happened. There is, I think, you know, there's embedded understanding um, it is local culture, um, but what's really interesting and what the book, book and the research showed is that, say for trying to figure out how, you, how do you grow agriculture in a really steep terrain, terracing is the technology, that's the innovation that was evolved. And I, find, I found terracing in 70 different locations and different communities around the world, and that is probably just scratching the surface. I found islanding in 63 different communities constructed artificial islands. They, there's a specific optimal typology of technology that you can see solving the same crises or scenario over and over again. And you started to catalog and understand these ideas 
that's the kind of thinking that I think we need to understand as designers, that there are methodologies, there are building blocks, there are ways that we can conceive of a migration of a technology that would then translate and have more specificity within a new context. It would, it would be understanding local environmental conditions. It would be understanding uh, weather patterns. It would be supported by local resources and availabilities. It would be supported by local people's knowledge of that landscape, that TEK pyramid that I showed there. And, and we also have this conception that culture is very static. And that, it's actually alive and, and culture shifts and changes. And so I think that there is this idea that we can translate the, these um, different technologies into different contexts that are of the same biome, of the same ecosystem. And in fact, we're going to have to do it. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think we see often, I mean, you've referenced Rudolfsky's um, exhibition and book architecture without architects um and you know there is from the university of melbourne um amos rapaport who is interested in vernacular architecture and he writes about how he's more interested in going and seeing uh how uh, the, the vernacular architecture rather than you know learning about modern architecture mm -hmm. um and and you know there's your book and it, and it seems that there's always this looking back to like, the foundations of building and architecture um, whenever there's a crisis. Mm -hmm. so do you see your, uh, now, Rappaport, I mean, uh, Rudolfsky was probably responding, you know, in the post-war for mm -hmm. seeking out a type of humanism, perhaps the same thing with Rappaport. But yours is different. It's a different crisis that you're responding to, or is it the same or somewhat similar? You see it, it yourself within the same framework. I mean, I see, I've been doing this work through teaching, um, working in developing countries, often in vulnerable communities that are really being hit by climate change for the last five, six years. And then on the flip side of that, doing this research, which is looking at different communities who've been dealing with really similar crises on a different scale and evolving, you know, okay, well, how do I live with water? Uh, and evolving all these different methods to live with water. Um, and I think fortunately or unfortunately, I might've been a little bit privy to an understanding of some of the really imminent crises that we were gonna see and that we were gonna be more publicized which we, we talk about more often now. So I was lecturing on global mass extinction 11 years ago. And, and, and I think now there's a lot more media coverage and maybe, you know, that's good or bad, but really I started thinking about a lot of this stuff. Um, there was a very distinct moment and I don't know if anyone in the audience is old enough to remember this, but Anne-Marie, you, you might be, um, there was, a global, there was an oil spill called the Exxon Valdez. And I was a little girl and I sat there watching for days and days, this terrible oil spill. It was the worst oil spill that had ever happened. And I saw birds being picked up and they were covered in oil and trying to be washed. And it was, it was just heart wrenching. I remember that day I was just like this, that, that was when the environmental consciousness happened for me. And I think that slowly it's happening now. So my, you know, the, the threads of where I come from and where I come to this work, they come out of, you know, a long time ago. But it does seem like, you know, I knew that there was, there was different crises occurring. And a lot of the people that I teach with, we talk a lot about for the last five years, what we can see happening, global migration, food shortages, like issues with water. And that's what we see now. And that's what this project and this work is really addressing. Um, mm -hmm. So it might, it, I, I guess it's sort of like, when does the consciousness come to anyone? And, and where does the consciousness become a mass consciousness? And I think that moment is now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, uh, you're right. I do specifically, that was, that was a big deal. And it it, that's frightening. exactly what I remember. These birds, they're trying to clean off birds with detergent. And it was just, yeah, that was a big wake up call. And I think that was a really good um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, because now it's not enough to just restore or do infrastructure for, you know, to grease the wheels of neoliberal capitalism. That, you know, that was the, th the stuff of previous generations. Yeah. For this generation, it's now about an infrastructure, creating an infrastructure that mitigates the repercussions or consequences of climate change. That's a reality I, now. Yeah, and I think it's not just an infrastructure, it's an ecosystem of infrastructures because what I find is a lot of the work, if I'm working, I was recently in Mozambique teaching in Mozambique and we were working with um, the government there and there was a particular city that had been hit by a hurricane last year. They would lost 90% of their housing and they were underwater for months and they still are recovering in terms of housing and they don't have food. And, and, you know, we were, we were, we were just saying like, how can it be that we, we don't understand that we have to be preemptive that this, and this, this particular place has been experienced these type of um, cyclones for a really, really long time. How can we, um, you know, how can we not think preemptively? How can, how can we not think as designers, if we know that these crises are occurring, um, how can we not, how can we sort of just go into disaster mode and not, not think about these mass type of preventions? And in each of these locations, there are ways to prevent uh, local technologies to prevent these types of occurrences in those locations. In this particular city, the government is hiring um, firms from overseas, specifically Dutch, to come and introduce infrastructure. And there is no contextual or local or technological relationship between what, what a, a Dutch design firm would produce and what the local context, and we can see it on the ground. And if you start to think of, you know, how do we attack, how do we respond to climate change globally with the fastest sort of and, and most, you know, um, effective method possible, if we would have conceived that we could identify local technologies that mitigate climate change, that give us food, that clean water, that do all these incredible things that add biodiversity and we can protect them and we can expand them and scale them on the ground using local knowledge, using resources that are already sustainable. They're built with understanding local knowledge and resources already. That's going to be the most effective way for us to mitigate climate change as designers. Mm. Yes. And you talk about that particularly with the uh, bushfires here in Australia in yeah. your TED talk. So yeah, uh, there's, other information there. That was just uh, a few more there. questions. Uh, are you are you game for just a few more questions? We have thirty five lined up, but I can Maybe see thirty five. Yeah, um, I can see there's some like similar ones. So Manning um, asked, well, he says, "Thank you for a fantastic, insightful lecture." Well, the uni students are so polite. Uh, do you have an idea of how some of these low-tech solutions or systems can be integrated to our modern cities on a large urban scale? And I think yeah, that's a question I do have, other than you know, offering um, indigenous plants, because and I think this is shows excitement for your work because we're yeah. I think immediately well most of us are going to be working around urban within, you know, how do we take these things that are happening in even remote lands and then importing that uh, to an urban environment? Does it translate? Yeah, and I think we also know that urban environments are gonna expand as populations, we think, still move to urban centers, I, we hope, in the light of COVID. Um, and I think the estimate is, you know, within the next 15 years, 75% of the population on earth might live in, in urban centers. And so urban centers are going to grow. How are they going to grow? How are the second and third growth rings? What are we as designers going to add to those landscapes? And can we think of nature-based technologies rather than the typical infrastructure through which these cities would be expanding? And we design different types of urban planning and urban design that would accommodate these types of infrastructures. So you're not going to design, design a wastewater treatment plant there's a single use wastewater treatment plant. You're gonna design something that is habitat, that cleans water, that provides food, that provides jobs. And that is gonna be a game changer. And they've started to replicate that system in Asia and in Europe already as weirdly as the, in, as the people who live in that particular system try to protect it from development, from 
from the city. Um, but that's one way that I can see. I'm not sure that we're going to take an agriculture system and put it in, you know, Federation Square, or <laughs> I'm not quite sure that that's going to happen. We can think about how we could integrate more biodiverse canopy conditions into cities. We could think about, you know, if we do internal atriums, is it one, two, three species? And then we go back to this idea of like indigenous biodiversity and rewilding. Um, but then there's the flip side to that question. And the flip side to that question is, our large urban centers. And our large urban centers have led us into a scenario where they're mostly desolate right now, especially where I am. Maybe not so much in Melbourne, um, but have we reached maximum densities? Do we know that we're not gonna see continuations of these types of transfers and then responses? Have we meet, reached a peak of how dense we should be? does our ecological footprint of our dense urban environments not match some of these types of systems? Therefore, our urban environments might then adapt to a smaller ecological footprint to embed these types of systems. Is there an ecological carrying capacity to some of these systems? An interesting example is the East Kolkata wetlands. That started by myth as one farmer accidentally letting sewage into his system and thinking that it would kill his fish, it doubled his yield and then other farmers expanded. So it was this emergent system that grew. But what also happened is the city of Calcutta grew. It had this mass global uh, population explosion of 400% in like the last 40 years. And as the city expanded, this ecosystem expanded with it to take in the waste. And so there are gonna be systems that will have this symbiotic relationship of expansion as it takes in material. But then, like the islands, there's going to be a limitation to a carrying capacity of a particular island uh, that's made out of biodegradable materials. So I think there comes to question, and a lot of people are questioning this, is like, you know, what the current formulation and the models of expansion and growth, is that right? And, and do we need to rethink that? Yeah, that's kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> um, Here's a question that it's also, I thought the same thing. Um, like you said, everyone loves the example of the tree bridge. And yeah. here, this, um, this question is, the example of the tree bridge, tree bridge growing from a man's scaffolding technique was an interesting one, considering it took around 50 years to grow, and only then would it could be used. Can you speak into how low tech could provide for the necessity and urgency of infrastructure in our time today with regards to the speed of construction and that, like that's a question also i have how much um is just time and patience you know uh it's in the, perhaps also in these um indigenous cultures that you're looking at in remote parts of the world they are just have a sense and awareness of time than we do here and that in an urban, let's say, area, and that we just are not patient enough. Yeah, they've got a leg up on us in terms of forward thinking and sustainability, for sure. And that goes back to this idea of multi-generational knowledge. So these particular trees are planned where they're planted. And then the trees, so it's not just the bridge that takes 50 years. The trees are grown from saplings because they have to match on either side of the river. And so these trees are grown. So this is like your great grandfather's grandfather who's grown the tree that you're eventually going to cross over the river. But we know, I mean, there are examples of uh, growing forests for 200 years from then, which you would make buildings and having that larger life, life cycle and time span. I mean, I don't think that's going to hurt any of us. Um, what I think is really interesting to think about and, and a topic that, uh, I'm starting to endeavor into understanding and, and really one of the reasons why I started doing this work, I was teaching landscape ecotechnology, which was high tech. And, and in, within that work, there's a lot of material systems that I explored. There are gels that, you know, hyperspeed and replace soils that hyperspeed growth rates of trees. And I think it starts to get really interesting 
given we have construction techniques that are very different from the, some of the construction techniques that build these low tech systems, given we have material technology technologies and nanotechnologies that are that we migrate from other fields from aeronautics and 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 space and we we constantly build these types of different technologies into how we landscape eco technology what's what would happen if we started to think of these indigenous and, and local technologies and started to think of a hybridization what would be the hybrid form of that and that's where i think it gets really interesting and that's where i think you know that's going to be an r d um project for for the next 150 years is like how do we really think of sustainability and how do we not just focus on this fascination with high tech? What's the bridge and what's the hybrid form? And I don't know that answer yet, but I'm hoping to explore it. Okay. Um, let me, some of them are just repeating um, questions, maybe just one more. Yeah. Um, or is there any maybe last uh, thoughts that you would like to um, give to the viewers who are watching this podcast to the students of the 21st century architecture, if they were interested in following, you know, becoming part of this low tech movement um, and finding out about other cultures that you don't have in your book, what would you, what was your advice for them? I would say, ask your academy and, and your professors to integrate this into your curriculum as much as you can and to adopt this type of thinking. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure how much this type, this exploration into um, nature-based cultures and nature-based technologies is integrated into the curriculum at the university. But I mean, this type of thinking, I think is, you know, it's going to be the next part of the next generation of technologies and it's part of our field and we can be the stewards of this you know of this really big shift and you know we talk about sustainability and greening cities but we don't I don't think anyone's really deeply imagined how vastly different we could conceive of building cities if we were to look at all these technologies which are in existence which are born out of the the types of scenarios that we're being confronted with so why would we why would we stick to the very small toolkit of technologies that were born of the Enlightenment, which was a group of white men of the 16th century that took a very small spattering of technologies that were from Western Europe and said this was technology? Why would we stick within that framework? Why wouldn't we consider all these hundreds, if not thousands, I don't even know yet, technologies? that are born of these local conditions and think about how that could influence our thinking. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think we will end on that note. And um, yes, thank you for um, speaking to us all the way from you know, the US and uh, take care. Thank you for the invitation and thank you everybody for joining in. Bye now. Bye.